Thanks for tuning in to Talk About here on Shaw TV North Island. My name is John Twig, and we've got another, I think it's going to be interesting show today. The guest is Andy, Lee, try that again, Andy Laidlaw, City Manager. Thanks, Andy, for coming in. Welcome to be here, John. Sure, a lot to talk about. <laughs> there are a lot of things happening in the city right now. Yeah. yeah. Now, you've been the City Manager for about three and a, three and a half years? Just over three and a half years now. Yeah. Well, almost three and a half years, yeah. Yeah. And you came from Nanaimo, where you were there. I saw Google do more than 20 years. I spent a long time in Nanaimo. I actually spent 35 years there. I had wow. four, four different positions, uh, which finished as a general manager there. Uh, we looked after protective services and public works, utilities, uh, parks and recreation, and emergency management. Yeah, and I saw the clipping when you were appointed. Uh, that uh, you, you told the newspaper down there, I get to run a city. At yeah, those days it was probably easier than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the next question is, yeah. well, how have you found it? I found it very interesting. Um, at the time I came, Campbell River was going through a significant transition. With the um, mill closure. With the mill closure, and that impacted a lot of things um, uh, with respect to local government in particular. Uh, this city used to get $7 million uh, from the mill, from industrial revenue, and I saw that diminish from $7 million just over the term that I was here to $200,000. Yeah. Now, we hope that will be uh, put back in place with some other endeavors on the industrial side, and we certainly hope for the LNG site out there and giving them all support we can so that the, those continue to, to bring back the uh, industrial tax base. Yeah, uh, actually, let's go there. Uh, the uh, Discovery LNG is looking to use the old mill site. Are you, do you have a hand in those negotiations? No, that's primarily managed by the, um, the organization themselves with the province. Our yeah. role is to uh, facilitate wherever we can to provide information, to assist with the, uh, the organization, with the province in terms of any regulatory issues, and we provide our uh, economic development uh, arm to yeah. work with them. So we're, uh, we're behind them and we're there to try and make it easy and um, bring this yeah. kind of enterprise to Campbell River. Yeah. Well, one of the questions I have, and I'm sort of jumping around a bit here, but uh, what do you think are the major challenges of the city now? I think the, the major challenge the city's had is trying to recover from the mill closure, both on a, a social perspective, uh, the impact on the uh, the residents here and of course all as well as the city. So I think a lot of those hurdles and a lot of those issues being dealt with. Now they have been dealt with quite painfully. Uh, the citizens have unfortunately seen um, higher residential taxes over the last couple of years. Uh, the amount of money the city's taking in in terms of its tax increases, it, it's not taking in additional revenue. It's been very flat over the last number of years. What has happened is the transition from the industrial sector to the residential sector. Yeah, that's what they call a tax shift. A tax shift. And we no longer look like the Powell Rivers or the Port Alberni's or the uh, Shumanus's North Cowichan. We now, on a tax basis, look much more like Vernon or Penticton. Yeah to a lesser extent, Kelowna, where it's a residential and, uh, and commercial tax base. Yeah. That uh, shift has been significant and it's triggered a lot of other things. Uh, what I think is really important though is looking to the future. There are a couple of you know, major capital projects with respect to the dam project and the hospital project and we can see people starting to make investments in Campbell River. If you look at our statistics building over the course of the last uh, year and a half, we are outpacing the Comox Valley quite significantly, and I think that is huge in terms of moving forward and getting some of the benefits, which I quite frankly thought would be longer coming uh, a number of years ago. Yeah. Um, do you think in retrospect that that uh, tax hike, I think it was about three years ago for two years ago, that uh, it was, what, 20 percent or something in, in one year? I think the increase was 13 percent. Oh, okay. And yes, and, and it was major. And council, of course, um, faced a very difficult uh, decision. Uh, they don't necessarily uh, know the timing that the BC Assessment Authority is going to lower those uh, taxation levels. We knew it was coming. Yeah. Um, they got hit with it relatively late and they had to make some decisions. And as all councils do, uh, the issue is the same. Um, are they going to continue to provide that service? Are they going to increase taxes or are they going to cut services? Of course, with the loss of revenue to that extent, that became highlighted. And what they did was they did both. They cut some services, 
and they increase taxes and of course that makes no one happy the people see significant increased taxes and at the same time you're getting a lower level of service for what you pay and that leads to some concern and unhappiness yeah. and and that's unfortunately what we had to go through now uh, the mayor was on here he's been on twice in the last six months and uh, he was making comments to the effect that the city staff is too large especially at the management level and he thinks it should be cut um, do you, do you share that view or? I, you know, one of the things that I try and be very vigilant about is to look at the organization internally and to try and match up the organization we have, management, union, all the things we do with the services to be provided. Yeah. So there is no absolute in terms of it's a too small, too large. It's trying to match the appropriate resources you have, uh, human resources to the services you're providing. Now, you need to do that on a benchmark basis as well, is to look outside. And one of the things we've done from a number of different studies that are done, uh, and they're called benchmark studies, or core reviews is the more common name. So we've looked to those cities that are similar to us. We have six communities, and we've looked at those reports, the number of management they have, the services they provide, um, the staffing levels that they have. And in every one of those reports, it is identified that the Campbell River staff both on a union and management basis is quite lean compared to the services we provide. Yeah. And we provide a lot of services that in other communities are actually provided by the regional district. Yes. Here the city is relatively insular and that provides all of those services such as transit, sewer, water, which in some places are provided by regional districts. Yeah, uh, and to be fair to the mayor, he was not talking, about, well, completely about slashing people, but more as there's some people coming up for retirement that may be an opportunity to mm -hmm. uh, right size or downsize. Mm -hmm. so. and, and those type of things are absolutely valid. I would agree with the mayor on that. Yeah. Uh, every position that comes up, whether it be a management position or a union position, is evaluated by the senior management team and we ask the questions, can this work be done differently? Is a position needed? Can it be amalgamated? And where can we strive to achieve efficiencies yet at the same time maintaining service? And uh, many of the services we do are considered core and we're not going to risk issues such as water and sewer, police, fire protection. Those need to be uh, resourced adequately compared to the services being yeah. provided. Yeah. Um, the, the water intake issue comes to mind in terms of, uh, you know, there's some concern uh, in council and in the local media that, oh, you know, if we get too dependent on one intake, which is not constructed yet. Uh, do you have a perspective on that? that well, I think, I think that's a good point, and I think you're always looking for redundancy in the system. And when we look at it as staff, and I think when the engineering firms look at it, they look at the system as a whole, and the question they ask is, what is the weakest part of those systems? What is most likely to fail? And in the case of our infrastructure, the answer to that question is going to be, uh, the older parts of the system. So we're building a new system here, it's up to seismic standards. That is going to be probably one of the more secure sources of the system. It's the other places downstream and some of those older pipes that okay. are much older that are more of a concern. If you would like to have full redundancy and you look at that for everything you do, but that comes at a cost and the question is you look at what your highest risks are and then try and mitigate those damages and decide what level you want to um, yeah. provide it. And that's what council will do when we bring them a report later. So you're month. not losing sleep over the water system right now? I'm not losing sleep over the water yeah. system um, except that it is an old system yeah. right now. Uh, the new system will be a lot more secure, it's underground, it meets current size, uh, seismic standards. So no, I'm not losing sleep over it, but at the same time we would like to provide as much redundancy in as many different places as we can within the system, recognizing yeah. that is an absolute core service yeah. to the community. Slight segue to Area D. Uh, we had Brenda Lee on recently talking about the referendum that's coming up on June 28th, mm -hmm. and she of course is against losing the northern part of Area D to the city. Uh, would you like to uh, take a few minutes to tell viewers why it's a good thing? Well, I think that um, what we're really asking is the residents of, of Area D in that portion to try to give us some feedback and decide whether in fact they would like to join the city. There are within that area densities that mimic the city's densities yeah. and sewer function is really um, a function of density. The more people you have there, um, the more need there is for sewer. This issue has been outstanding a number of times. They've uh, had a vote on it many years ago. Well, they were unable to conclude successful negotiations with the city. 
So I think this is really to try and bring some finality to the issue of are we going to be including them in terms of a sewer service, and if they are, they need to uh, be part of the city and that opportunity is there. The city's perspective of this is a referendum, the residents will choose whatever decision the residents make is the right decision and the city will go on planning its infrastructure and its design from there. That kind of echoes what the sentiment was from council when they voted to proceed. I mean, I know there was a couple of councillors that voted, yes, let's have a referendum in order to, like, just let's settle it and mm -hmm. then we can move on. Yeah, and I think we have done some planning and there's been money invested on potential uh, in infrastructure upgrades so they could yeah. accommodate Area D in the, in the future. Yeah. Um, we want to get some finality to that and have a decision because we're faced with our own infrastructure upgrades and they're going to be significant and we need to move on for this. So I think this is really saying if this is something that the residents want, the densities are there to facilitate a sewer service, they can do it. Uh, it comes with a downside. There are downsides being part of the city, which does mean increased taxes, and yeah. there's benefits for that. Yeah. Um, it's really going to be a choice by those residents who are going to be affected. Yeah. Now, in terms of city growth, I know there's lots of land, like towards the airport or towards the Quinson Crossing, and of course, north of the bridge as well. Um, that's not really a constraint. What will the, uh, the infrastructure issues that you're thinking need to be addressed? With respect to... Uh, well, you were saying in terms of Area D, we got to know oh, so we can... We have infrastructure issues. I mean, when the um, staff, you know, 60, 80 years ago uh, came along in various cities and local government, including Campbell River, and they put pipes in the ground, they went to their councils and said, you know what, these pipes are going to last 60, 80 years. Yeah. And guess what? They were right. They did last that long. Yeah. But they haven't been replaced to a large degree. Yeah. So the major issue facing local governments across Canada is how do they fund these infrastructure upgrades, primarily water and sewer, to a lesser extent storm sewer, yeah. into the future because they have not been putting a lot of enough money away to deal with it. Yeah. Um, the Auditor General for Local Government is now reviewing that with a number of municipalities oh, yeah. and I believe that the report that will come down will identify those communities, including us, that we're not dealing uh, with our assets uh, in terms of replacements uh, sufficiently. We need to put more money into it and we need to have better planning. And I think you'll see that across all local governments, but yeah. there's a, a reticence to start doing planning when you don't have the money. But yeah. those pipes do need to be replaced and yeah. uh, uh, they will have to be done. And of course, yeah. we're looking at some of the senior governments to help with that. Yeah. Um, Great but segue to the clipping absolutely. in front of you. <laughs> absolutely. The, the federal government has just announced some infrastructure money uh, with fewer strings attached, yeah. I think. But, you know, like the structural funding of local government has been a, a major unaddressed issue for a long time. What's, can you tell us about that? Well, we're working on a system that really developed in the late 1800s, and it's been subject to very little change. So the, the taxation system for local government is based on the value of your house, house. Nowadays, it's the relationship of how much you have in the house and the value of it may be very different from your income. They, they're just, they've separated from what used to be the, uh, be the case. And they're not even attached to the services. So this system we have of taxing people by the value of their house is quite antiquated and causes hard hardship for a lot of people, particularly seniors. Yeah. And the government has acted to triage that with different grants in a number of ways. But we only have property tax to depend upon except for those grants of the senior governments. So they make taxes and they turn around, they cut services, they download them to the cities, uh, local governments, and we're now going to handouts and saying, we need money for infrastructure because you haven't given us any other tools to raise funds. They've come close. I mean, they've looked at giving us part of a gas tax, yeah. money for infrastructure. Uh, they make a supply for these other you know, sewer water funds. But it's really uh, a relationship which uh, I think could be improved and needs to be improved and is, is quite but, antiquated. But how? I think that um, the number one issue, and you see this in some of the local governments in the United States and the big cities, they have other methods of raising funds. They can have local taxes, they can have consumption taxes, they can have part of the, the gas tax that may be, you know, local area, they have the freedom to choose to do that. 
We don't have any of that. Yeah. So there's a lot of different options with respect to how we might generate some of that revenue so we're not going back to our taxpayers all the time and saying we need more or going to the federal and provincial governments and say we need a handout and competing with each other for the available funding. Yeah, that's another thing. Municipalities bidding against each other to get a, a new store. It, Pretty much. <laughs> drive it to the bottom. Now, in the news, interestingly, the uh, city of Seattle has just set a minimum wage, and I gather in the United States, local governments can set things like minimum wages. Could We, we couldn't do that here, though. No. Um, many of the local governments, and particularly the larger ones in the United States, have a different structure. Uh, they have different responsibilities, they have a different reporting, and yeah. most importantly, they have a different tax regime. Yeah. Um, they have a very, very strong, what they call a mayor system where the mayor has an executive staff and uh, is, of course, elected directly and has a lot more responsibilities than what you tend to see across the provinces of Canada where we have different structures, where you have councils uh, that are defined their responsibility by the provincial governments under what's called the Local Government Act. Yeah, this is a great segue to my favorite question. Yeah. What's it like working for a maverick mayor? Well, one of the things that city managers across the province will tell you um, we work for councils, yeah. and councils and individual members of councils always have different opinions. That's why with the electum, I don't think you want anything as homogenous. You want different views, mm -hmm. different values, reflecting different views of the electorate brought to the table. And it's that consolidation of the group that can change at any time. We don't have party systems. We're not always having you know, no. votes of the majority. A vote on any particular issue at city council across the province can be changed on the issue. And I think it's a much better system. Yeah. So we operate on the basis of a council. In the case of our system, the four is the majority. Um, the number on council is defined in the community charter uh, for each size community getting larger as you, as you move forward. Um, but you work for councils and you undertake their, um, their directions and they can be different from issue to issue to issue. And that's probably some of the, uh, the interesting part of it. It makes it exciting because you're not working in a party system. Yeah. Now, there's uh, seven people on council, six councillors and one mayor. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the vote is six to one against the mayor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's four to three or five to two mm -hmm. and, or two to five. Mm -hmm. But um, so I, I, in preparing for this show, I checked out the duties of the chief administrative officer, city manager, assists council to establish its strategic direction and acts as liaison for the mayor. So it's kind of like you got two bosses, really, the council as a whole, but also the mayors from time to, the, from time, to time? Yeah, and the way the, the community charter sets that out and the duties um, somewhat um, is a little bit different from the way it happens in practice. Um, what you have is the mayor is the identified as a spokesperson for council, yeah. and it's my job to assist council to work for the strategic objective, and once council makes the decision, on any particular issue to work with staff to implement that decision. That decision can be 7 nothing, it can be 6-1, it can be 4-3. Uh, from staff's perspective, that's irrelevant. We have a decision by council and we act on, yeah. the, on that basis. Yeah. Recently, uh, there was a, an attempt to reverse the decision about the uh, stoplight at uh, Peterson and 14th. Uh, and there was procedurally some questions about how you can do that. But uh, you, you don't see reversals very often, I don't think. No, the, you, you do, we do have a system within the council procedure bylaw, it's called, where people, can, if they're on the, um, the opposite side and they want to make a change, can come back and, and bring it back. And the mayor has some special responsibilities there. Yeah. Uh, so you do see sometimes revised. It may be yeah. new information that comes in. Um, but it, the system does provide that, and it all is laid out in the council policy, which is, has to be in conformity to the community charter and the Local Government Act. We're very much a creature of the province, and the act only tells us what we can do. Uh, outside of that, there's very little we can yeah. do. It's quite prescriptive. Yeah. Okay, turning a bit to uh, city issues. Uh, uh, yeah, well, actually, how this started, uh, there was a story by... Uh, is it Neil Cameron here in the paper? Courier Islander. Anyway, city gets good marks for community connections. And the city's website won an award. And uh, the city manager was quoted talking about it. And that's you. Um, th but the website doesn't have a biog of you on it. doesn't have a picture. <laughs> and there's a lot of other things like the, the council broadcast, 
which is streamed live on meeting nights and then also available. But you can't find it very easily. You have to know where to go. So it, it's a good website, uh, but I think it could be better. And, and that's a good point, and I can even share that experience sometimes where I'm looking for something and I have to do a second look and sort of research it. Um, many of the things that we do are interrelated and knowing exactly where to look for. For example, those things that you mentioned are all on the website. The fact that they're not easy to be found is a concern and we need yeah. to make them easier. So this is um, an evolving process. Um, yeah. I think the website that we've uh, brought in over the course of the last uh, year is a huge improvement over what the, there yes. were previously. I, I think that. it has a search engine on it. You can find things. Can it be better? Can it be up to date? Um, yeah, it can be. Yeah. One of the things we try and do is change the front page and some of the keys on there to reflect the, the topical issues, the media issues, if there's taxation issues with tax season we're in now, to try and reflect that and make those things which are timely easy for people to find. And sometimes that'll push the other things a little bit behind, yeah. but there's no question that kind of feedback that it's difficult to find is something, you know, I take back and say, we need to take a look at that and yeah. see if we can constantly yeah. change this because it is a constantly changing. Yeah. And we have a lot of information we yeah. want to try and get out. Well, uh, uh, I was fascinated by uh, the, the gist of this uh, story here. I'm not sure if this is the... Yeah, here it is. City uses new technology to save money. And they're quoting you. Uh, but uh, what are some of the ways that sort of like new media, social media, are helping the city be more effective? Well, one of the things we're always cognizant about, John, is that we try and communicate with all of our citizenry. And we like to try and be innovative where we can. Um, we are now using um, Facebook. We're experiencing with that. We're trying to in encourage people to speak with us. It's a resourcing issue as well, so we don't want to do something where we set it up and can't respond to the issues that are there. We're trying to get input from the public on the kind of services they would like to see ways that we can improve those services and there's no question there's ways we can improve all of our services and get that feedback and we're going to look at any kind of uh, new way to do that in terms of social media. We can't leave those people behind who are wanting to use the newspapers. Newspapers is a very very viable function here. People read it and it's what we've determined is still the main source of communication but we're going to try and maintain what we do and reach out in some new ways uh, through but our coming communication. On TV? any way we can in terms of outreach because we get you know a lot of questions and concerns and issues brought forward and to a large extent a lot of those are about communications or misunderstanding and we have some responsibility for that so where we can improve that system where we can reach out to the community where we can correct information uh, where we can advertise to make people aware of those services we want them to do that or we want to do that because yeah. it's their tax dollars and they should be getting benefit from it yeah um, the, the uh, senior center jumps to mind. Uh, have you got any thoughts on that? Well, I think that um, being in that age category myself, I could have lots, but I think that it's uh, the most important thing out of that is that we have um, people who want to work together collegially, who recognize the value of recreation, the, the value of participating in the community, and that's for me job one. So then the question becomes, and for council as well, and then the question is how to best facilitate that. Should it be as part of a community centre where you interact with all the other age groups? Because uh, that's a very common model. Should it be kind of the Victoria older model of the seniors silver threads kind of model in terms yeah. of the care? But I think the key issue is uh, there's a demand and need for additional recreation. Um, a lot of that is of, of the social nature as well yeah. and the cities have traditionally and I think here uh, responded to that and it's one of the services yeah. that probably you know many years ago we wouldn't be into but one of the yeah. things the citizens are saying yeah. it's important to us and council is looking at that to, to know, find a way to do it. Uh, I'm hoping to do a show on the senior center uh, and in researching that uh, I discovered, I guess it's not a revelation, that uh, a senior center can save government money by keeping more citizens healthy and keeping them out of the hospital. But of course, the city doesn't benefit directly from keeping them out of the hospital. That's a provincial expenditure. Well, I guess we probably do and that we have less, you know, more capacity in the hospital. But I think the whole concept of active living 
is very, very topical, and we talk about it with respect to seniors, and the seniors are definitely, you know, or my age group, much more active than they were, you know, 20, 30 years ago when I started. Yeah. And I've also heard the reflection of concerns about um, uh, children as well. I mean, you're hearing the, the news reports of childhood obesity being at all-time records. Uh, yeah. I don't think there's been a generation where our, the youth have been um, is not as un or unfit as yeah. their parents. So it, it goes across the spectrum in terms of healthy living, providing those opportunities, whether they're outdoor, opportunities for, for bike riding or walking or everything else, are become key functions of all yeah. local governments. It's interesting though, you know, like there's two different social issues for seniors and for kids, and they've sort of been neglected by the senior governments, and the problems get downloaded to the local government. Yes, um, because City councils um, are very close to their um, to their electorate. Um, you can come in and complain or issue a concern or come to city council very easily. Try and do that at the legislative assembly or the federal government, and they hear those type of things. And um, local governments across the yeah. province, across the country, have picked up those interests and said this is important to us. Yeah. And they've picked them up on uh, big capital project as well. And you you can look at the number of cities that have built large um, WHL hockey arenas. Yeah. You know, f yeah. was that a function yeah. of ours 20 yeah. years ago? No. Yeah. Well, I've got a list of about 20 things we haven't talked about, the homeless shelter, the RCMP, job creation, food self-sufficiency, so. Um, but uh, uh, there was one, uh, the downtown project. Right. Uh, how do you feel about how that's come along? I feel very good about that. I think that's an issue that council identified at the beginning of their term as a strategic priority. Council has been sticking to that at every turn. Staff have been working in concert with them to, to move those issues forward. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done that um, still has to come to fruition. But I think that everybody's been on that same page uh, to a person in wanting to re revitalize downtown. A yeah. uh, strong downtown is key to a community. And I think if you go yeah. across the province, uh, the number of communities that have sent their um, um, a lot of their shopping centers and institutions to the suburbs are now looking to how do we get it back to the downtown. Yeah. And so, uh, Campbellton, we've only got two minutes left. Okay. Is Campbellton part of your, your vision? Campbellton is an area that has mixed use there. Um, they don't have some of the ser physical services that other communities do. Yeah. And I think the role of the organization there and the citizens and working with the city and identifying some of those are as absolutely key. And those things are going to have um, benefits into the, into the future. Okay. Now, my famous last curveball question, there's lots of stuff we didn't deal with. Is there something that you'd like to pass along? Um, I think if anything would be Campbell River has uh, gone through a very difficult time. Yeah. My view, it's turned the corner. Financially, we still have some scars in terms of our reserves and a few other issues that we need to deal with uh, coming out of that. But I see with the current proje projects, uh, I think the legacy out of that will be people coming and staying here. And the positive, positive comments I get from people about Campbell River and some of our external media has been very, very beneficial. So I think Campbell River has turned this around very quickly. And I think that um, it's because it's such a great place to live. Uh, the, the waterfront is great and people come here because it gets back to it's an active living place and the quality of, quality of life is excellent. So you're not going anywhere soon? I'm staying here for now. Good for you, okay. Well, our guest has been Andy Laidlaw, City Manager of uh, Campbell River. And thanks, Andy, for okay. coming in. Thanks, John, for having me. And uh, thank you, volunteers. Thank you, Shaw TV North Island. We're uh, viewable on YouTube as well. If you go to the Shaw TV North Island, Google it, you'll find us there. So thanks for watching, and uh, we'll be back. Yeah.